the local media has an agenda that they're going to serve. I don't know who's in charge of it or what it is, if it's like a headless monster. You know, I was pretty happy with that one in Gerbils the other night. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a good pizza. <laughs> yeah. Fat wallets and empty hearts. Which... Hey, everyone. Oh, it's that time of the week. It's insane how little musicians get. Huh. So, um, yeah, if, if... Well, that was interesting. Um, the intro video decided not to play, so we're just going to go with it. Uh, this is the Pennsylvania Rock Show, episode number 715. Uh, with me tonight, we will get to in just a moment. Um, you just heard three tracks. Uh, they were um, Royal Honey, The Tease, then Eden on Fire, Love Bomb, and then the third track was Buck Johnson, Just Feel Better. And uh, speaking of Buck Johnson, that is my guest tonight. What's up, Buck? What's up, Bill? How's it going, man? Not too bad. That was the first time that's ever happened. <laughs> okay. I've done a lot of shows, and that's the first time. It's special, then. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll call it rare. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like a top rare card that's misprinted or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so before we get too far into this, I, I told you off the air, I was going to ask you to mention some of your credentials and they are far and wide and lots of names that people are going to know. So why don't we start there? <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I am the keyboardist and backing vocalist for Aerosmith and uh, the Hollywood vampires and also for the Joe Perry project. Um, I've worked as an artist myself with record deals with uh, in rock and in country um, I've played with artists such as John Waite, um, backing vocalist for the Doobie Brothers on a live album. Um, gosh, you know, Matthew Sweet, I toured with, uh, Tal Bachman did his album, which had a number one called She's So High. That was with Bob Rock producing, you know, known for Metallica and many other great artists. Um, you know, I've just been fortunate over the years, just, um, worked hard, I moved from Alabama to California to LA in the early nineties and just, you know, said yes to as many things I could do that I felt like I do even things I didn't know if I could do. It scared me, but I still did it and, uh, surprised myself and, and through relationships, like in any business, you know, you hopefully, you know, make good allies and good friends and uh, you move forward and more there are more opportunities present themselves. Sorry, I had to mute myself. My wife buzzed into the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens, you know. <laughs> it's live. All kinds of things. Happen. Live TV. It's great. You know. You don't probably, hopefully, you won't hear my two chihuahuas barking downstairs. My I, wife. I there. actually planned on asking you about them because the Laverne and, and Shirley thing. <laughs> yes, right. Of course. Yeah. So I'm like, clearly, you, I'm guessing that that, that Lenny was yes. first. No, then... actually, no, it wasn't Lenny first. We had, um, he was, these are both rescue chihuahuas and. About six years ago, we rescued one from the same uh, East Tennessee small dog rescue. Uh, Brad Whit Whitford from Aerosmith rescued one, and we rescued one. And um, ours was called, his name is Cowboy, and he's about this big. He's all of like four pounds, and he's got a flopped ear. And, uh, you know, we fell in love with him, and he's he was a good dog. And we had another dog at the time, so we had two. And then the other dog passed away a couple of years ago. And um, so we had Cowboy, and we thought, well, Chihuahuas like to be alone, one number one dog. So, But we had friends who, um, my friend who's a guitar player, Tony Higby, shout out to Tony, plays with Tom Kiefer. Um, and he also plays with me with Brother Kane, with Damon Johnson. Uh, Tom, uh, he and his girlfriend do an amazing job rescuing, rescuing animals. And they found this chihuahua named Lenny. And uh, he was found by the side of the road, of course, and just abandoned. And uh, so we fell in love with him and took him in. He has an overbite. And so him next to Cowboy, who's black and smaller, it's like, oh, it's Lenny and Squiggy. You know, from a Laverne and Shirley, because, uh, you know, Lenny's got the overbite and Cowboy's the loud, loud, boisterous one 
you know, the dark hair. So uh, we just thought that was pretty funny. Uh, does Cowboy answer to Squiggy? Uh, he he will, but you know he's Cowboy was his name, you know, and that's that we call him that. But we we also call him Lenny and Squiggy, you know, sometimes. Cool. Um, the other thing that I saw on that list that I wanted to ask you about was your uh, chicken piccata from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, not many people ask me these questions. So, Bill, I, I, this is kind of fun. Um, you know, I, when I first moved to L.A. in the early 90s, you know, while I'm saying yes to any gig I could take, I'm also having to work a day job, too. And I did that for many years. You know, um, uh, you know, I was waiting tables and working in great restaurants. And, you know, you pick up a thing or two. And, uh, and I like chicken piccata and I like, all right, show me what you do, you know. And I just over the years have really developed it myself, you know, to its own thing. And um, I don't know. It's it's OK, I guess. My wife loves it. And so <laughs> special occasions, I'll, I'll 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 whip it out. See, the this, chicken piccata, that is. Right. Right. I knew what you meant. <laughs> <laughs> so that segues perfectly into one of my questions that one of the other DJs told me not to ask you. Which yeah. means I have to ask you. Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> um, so I have two main questions that I always ask on the show. And this one is um, I, I want to know what the best pizza you've had because you're a musician. So you have to link it to like a tour or a recording session or at a gig or something along those yeah. lines. Um, well, I'm not good at remembering names of restaurants, um, but I've toured a lot of places around the world. But hey, you can't beat a New York pie. I'm sorry. It's just, uh, you know, no offense to Chicago or anybody else. Um, we've got a couple of places around here in Nashville that do a pretty good job. But, uh, you know, New York pie is where it's at. And uh, and I know there's, a, you know, the, the one that everyone talks about or two that uh, is the one to get. But uh, someone will remind me when I'm going there and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll make sure I stop, swing by and grab a slice. I um, I went to Chicago years ago to watch the Penguins play the Bruins outdoors. And oh, yeah, what I, that's cool. What, what I remember about that trip mostly was, yeah. one, it, it was the coldest I've ever been in my life. Okay. Two, I went to – um, oh, now I'm going to blank on his name. Um, Legends. What? It's his restaurant. He's a blues guitarist, famous. He's won Grammys. I can't think of his name now. Um, uh, well, you're stumping me because I'm a uh, Chicago. Terrible. I should know this too. Um, um, buddy Guy? Yes. Buddy, buddy Guy's guy. Legends. Yeah. That yeah. was that was the highlight, and I couldn't remember the name. That was the highlight. We went yeah. there to eat lunch. There was a guy <laughs> guy playing acoustic yeah. blues on the stage. It was awesome. Well, let me and, say this. It's, it's wherever you are is where it is great. Because like if you're there in Chicago and you're having the authentic Chicago pie in a restaurant and it's fresh – then you can't really beat that yes. too, as opposed <laughs> to Nashville's version or store bought version, which is going to be never as good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had our, our Chicago style pizza after the game in the hotel when we were trying to thaw out. So <laughs> it was good hear? and it was hot. Did the penguin? No, win? no the Bruins oh. crushed us. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. But, all right, so I have another question for you in this segment, and then we'll take a break and listen to another song. Um, and I may as well ask you the other question. It's going to be probably a little weird because I feel like you, you probably have played with them already. <laughs> so the question is, who's your Dave Grohl? And what I mean by that is, who do you want to be like in the crowd and have them bring you up on stage to play with them? Because you know, the Foo oh. Fighters do that all the time. You know, when, when if I was in the crowd and an artist brought me on stage, um, you know, um, gosh, maybe Paul McCartney. Oh. That would be I mean, I would be I wouldn't know what to do. I'm like, uh, you know, I'm not worthy. I'm not <laughs> worthy. I mean, I've been lucky. I've worked uh, with some legends, you know, Steven Tyler, Alice Cooper, Um just to, you know, start there. I mean, and I would be feeling the same way if I hadn't worked with them already, you know, so I have a little different perspective, but you know, I mean, I've never met Paul McCartney and I saw his concert and, you know, it was emotional, you know, it's, it's history. And uh, if you were invited on that stage, you know, oh my gosh, pretty, pretty special. It's, 
it's funny that you picked him because he and Dave are pretty close friends. I, I get yeah, I imagine so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to listen to Half Will's song, Good Day. We're going to okay. come back, and we're going to talk a little bit about your song, and I'm going to ask a couple more of my, my not normal questions. <laughs> you got it. And uh, for those of you on the video side, you're going to um, – Get to see me give away some tickets here momentarily. Okay, let's try this. So I have tickets to give away to Lil Xan, Alexa Terrestrial, and I think it's pronounced Slimmy, <laughs> Enclave in Pittsburgh. Uh, that is on March 28th, 8 p.m. Um, and Lil Xan is the headliner. If you want to head out there and purchase tickets, uh, they are $27 up to $30. It is an all-ages event. Um, the Enclave is the former, former Rex Theater there on Carson Street, if you're not familiar. Um, Dressy Entertainment gives us two tickets to give away each week, and you'll learn more about what tickets are available coming up shortly. But for now, we're going to give away these two. Um, we had three people sign up. A little low on, on, on that this week, but we'll see what happens next week. We had uh, Tina Ladig, Nikki Praza, and Andrew Carr. I'm going to go ahead and shuffle my wheel and spin. And we will see who our winner is. And those tickets are... Headed to Andrew Carr. So, Andrew, you've won a, a few times. You know that you're keeping an eye on your email, and uh, you'll be receiving an email from me tonight and another one from Justy Entertainment explaining how to pick up your tickets. With that said, let's go back to our conversation with Buck. Okay. <laughs> so, your song, Just Feel Better. I noticed that the title, unless I, I, I'm misremembering, is is it the same song you did with Santana or just the same? Oh, yeah. No, it's the same song. I mean, I, I wrote the song with my good friends Damon Johnson and Jamie Houston um, almost 20 years ago. And uh, <clears throat> a few years after that, we found out that, um, well, mainly because Jamie Houston had the connection to Clive Davis and was able okay. to have Clive Davis hear it. And and I'm saying the demo and they were, Clive was actually, you know, it's just kind of like, like anything. And, you know, it's like you do enough, we write enough songs, write, you record enough, you pitch so many and eventually you hit, you know, and this one hit, it was right timing. Uh, Clive was looking for a song for Santana. Uh, he had already done a few albums with those duets, you know, and this was like the third one. And he was looking one for Santana and Steven to sing because, you know, Clive signed Santana and Aerosmith. And so to put two Hall of Fame famers, Rock Hall of Famers together, it would have been it was to be the event of the year for him and his label. Anyway, um, you know, it was just really blessed and fortunate that it was uh, recorded by him. And um and then, you know, over the years, many friends and my wife would say, hey, you should put out your own version. You know, you know, you had a great demo. And I'm like, all right, well, maybe. And, you know, one thing would always get in the way. I'm touring or I'm working on this other project or this other band. And, well, the time finally came where I, when I was doing this record that I thought, OK, I'll, I'll record it and, and put my version out. So one of the names you mentioned in there. I told you that I was going to have to ask you about because my daughter was reading over my shoulder. Um, Jamie Houston mm -hmm. has the link to high school musical. And she actually stopped mid sentence when she read, read it and then did the fan girl thing behind me. So I promised her I would ask you about high school musical and, and what your link is to that. Um, well, you know, Jamie, as I mentioned, is a good friend of mine. I met him shortly after I moved to LA, he's from Tennessee. I'm from Alabama. And so we had some mutual common things. Um, we started writing together. Eventually we put a band together and, you know, it was one of those bands that was supposed to be the next big thing. And, 
you know, it never really happened, but we maintained this long work time friendship and working collaboration over the years. Um, and at some point, you know, I was, we were, he was signed with Warner Chapel, the band I was signed with to Warner Chapel. And then he moved over to Disney and started working for them, you know, and, and he was a staff producer as well as a writer. And uh, so they would put a project on his desk, like, okay, here's this thing next, uh, high school musical. And no one knew what it was going to be or how big it could be. Uh, and so he would hire me to I needed a string orchestration for this ballad, you know, in the first one, or I need keyboards or piano on this one, you know. And uh, so, you know, I was always a work for hire for Disney. So it was whether I was doing an elaborate string orchestration or when he was doing Hannah Montana and I just need some explosions at the top of the course, you know, which took me 10 minutes. It was still the same money, you know, regardless. Right. <laughs> uh, but hey, you know, you take the work and it's again, it's those relationships. And uh, he had really good success with that. You know, I'm happy for him. And, um, you know, uh, it's uh, it's interesting that uh, you never think in a million years you'd be working on some show for Disney. And then the next day you're working with, you know, some heavy metal artists. It's just, you know, in this, in this world, you you, you kind of have to wear a lot of hats. And the more you can do and the more you're capable of doing, the, the better chance of success. Um, I, I'm I'm going to really take a turn here. And I'm going to ask you one of my my odd questions. All right. Um, shoot. So, you're, so you're leaving your gig and there is a DeLorean sitting there with its door open and a flux <laughs> capacitor in the back seat. Okay. Where, where are you going in time and what band are you going to hang out with while you're there? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I guess because the only reason I mentioned Paul McCartney before, I, I, I guess I'd have to say 1963 when the Beatles hit and they're on, um, you know, they're on in America for the first time and, uh, and, and just soak in what they're thinking and what they're, feeling and i mean you know i guess when i've been around artists i've worked with whether it was you know you know aerosmith or <clears throat> or with johnny depp with the vampires you get a little bit of that beetle mania you know when you're you know in a new town or going into the hotel or whatever so i can tell what that feels like but the the excitement musically no that's they're doing something that hasn't been done before you know i mean it's not I mean, they had all their influences they pulled from, which were known, but no one had seen or heard this before. And and uh, I mean, I was there in L.A. and when Nirvana hit, you know, and I knew then it's all about to change, you know. And those are those moments in time and music where that has happened. And that was probably the biggest. The Beatles changed everything, you know. Um, let, let's talk about some other artists. You'll see what I mean. <laughs> so for some reason, while you're on tour, which with whichever band, you hire me to drive the tour bus. What music am I going to play in between show stops while we're, while we're driving from oh, one, one game yeah, to the next? That we're all listening to? Yep. Because you it'd be only you listening. Because <laughs> You know, it's like my time off. Usually, I'm not listening to music unless I have, unless it's something that, you know, after you play a show, especially, I just you got to give your ears a rest, you know, um, and it just makes it seem more fresh when you you're approaching the stage and 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 um, you haven't been listening. I mean, I guess when you're in the dressing room warming up, that's when we listen to music stuff that gets us fired up, you know, and it can be a range of surprising what what artists would listen to you'd be shocked in some cases um i know some heavy rock artists that listen to country music before they go on stage it's whatever works for you you know but on the bus i would say uh man whatever keeps you awake you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that and, seems like a valid answer <laughs> yeah right you know uh Hey, if you want to listen to uh, some 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 really thrashing metal and that keeps you awake and keeps you fired up, then by all means, go for it, brother. Um, See, in that situation, I, I would be, probably be introducing you guys to a lot of music you hadn't heard before. Okay. Because, yeah. Yeah. Because most of what I, I listen to and all of what I play on the show is unsigned. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm sure you get wow. a lot of great music that none of us have heard. Uh, and I always say that. I think there's a lot of great, you know, we talk about the 60s and the 70s, all these landmark artists. And, and you know, in the, in the age of video in the 80s, where, you know, you go see these bands now, whether it's Aerosmith or Foreigner or uh, the Doobie Brothers and, you know, the Eagles, you know, um, Kiss, you know, every song in the set's a hit song. Well, nowadays it's changed so much. There's so many great artists out there, but it's hard to know about them all. You know, I think there's some great music and great albums being, you know, made today that a lot of people don't know about. It's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. So we need more people like you, Bill, to give these bands exposure. Thank you. Speaking of more people like me, Jonna, who just commented in the chat room, um, owns hey, First, Angel, First Angel Media, which is a um, company that runs out of Pittsburgh that does reviews for local bands and photography for you know both um, gig photography and you know, the promo shots. And the, yeah. the, she does a ton of stuff. But the, her comment I wanted to read, it says, I tune in and within five minutes I hear about Santana High School Musical and that he was there in the midst of, of it all with Nirvana. Holy cow, what's it like being with the most interesting people in the world? <laughs> uh, wow, you know, I I pinch myself. I can't believe I'm around some of these people, you know. Um, uh, I guess, you know, after a while when you're working with them, they just become Stephen and Joe and Brad. And um, they're still my boss. I still know my place, you know, and stay in my lane and all those things. But uh you know, it's pretty cool, man. I can't lie to you. You know, I, I get to uh, be on a private jet with, you know, Joe Perry, Alice Cooper, and Johnny Depp, you know, and uh, it's it's surreal. It's like it's a fantasy world, and I'm out on tour, and, uh, you know, and I'm with these guys and, and playing shows, and then I come home to Nashville, and I'm cutting my own grass, and nobody knows who I am. <laughs> they just know me as my, I'm the neighbor, Buck, and, and my wife, Kim, and we're pretty low profile, you know, keep it on the low, down low, you know, but uh, I like it that way. I like coming home and peace and quiet because it is crazy out there when we're out. It's, 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 a, it's, you're moving, it's, you know, it's loud in ears, music being played and, you know, all the rehearsals and everything it leads up to it. And so when I come home, I just, I have my studio here and I just uh, kind of, a, you know, studio rat, I guess. So, I, I read, and I can't remember if it was in the bio or on the, the one sheet, but it said that you started performing when you were six? Yeah. Well, I'm from Alabama, as I mentioned, and my family, I come from a musical family, and uh, my mom plays piano, and my dad and my uncles, they're all singers. They had a go Southern Gospel Quartet and um, matching suits, the whole thing. And, you know, I, I, I can't remember a day growing up where mom didn't play every day or there wasn't singing every day in the house. And, you know, mama says I was singing before I was walking. And uh, that's because of them, you know, and they're super talented. And, and I guess that kind of keeps you humble because there's so many in my family who are so talented. Um, they just never pursued it as a career. They just wasn't practical for them. You know, sometimes the cards don't play out for you. You know, you have kids and you have a decent job and that's what you do. And, but they still love getting together and sing and on the weekends, but, you know, as they were touring when I was a kid, they would, you know, drag me out on the road with them. And, and I loved it. You know, it was mostly weekends. Um, and, um, you know, they would prop me up on stage and sing. And, you know, and I started singing with them. And then <clears throat> as I got into junior high, you know, my neighbors and, you know, I would ride to school with them and they listened to the rock radio station that uh, we didn't play in our house. See, I think you're about to answer a question that I didn't ask yet. OK. And and, right. and that's that question is, when did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Well, I knew at a young age because you get the attention, you know, and I knew I could sing. You know, like I said, I think if you get children at that formative years, those birth to five it's like a building block, you know, and it doesn't mean you have to do music for a career, but what a great foundation because we know what music can do to other faculties of the brain for language, math, you know, math and music are like this, right? So um, I don't know. I, I, I was lucky that I had parents who instilled that in me and encouraged me. 
and I knew, hey, people are liking what I'm doing up here. And I could feel it, you know, like I know I could sing in tune and I was bringing it, you know, and and they're raising their hands and they're hooping and hollering. And I used to say we'd go to these churches that were just short of snake handling. So they're they're <laughs> speaking in tongues and everything. And and it was an energy. It's the same kind of energy I think you feel at a rock concert. It's really the same thing. You know, it's this people together. They're feeling music and it's powerful, man. And um, and I just it was in my blood and it never left. And of course, it didn't hurt when you get to junior high and you put your own bands together because you're hearing these songs on the radio and you want to do those songs. And then the girls are noticing you. Yes. Because I was a shy, <laughs> reclusive boy, you know, and I'm like, okay, but I can get up on stage and sing. And we played all the, you know, the skating rinks and the pool parties and, you know, and then that ends up and in, goes into high school. And then you're, I'm in college and I'm playing all the frats and the bars and throughout the South and, you know, and then, get this crazy idea. Hey, I can do this, you know? And, uh, but I had, I think to get those intentions, you have to have that foundation I mentioned of, uh, have been forming and, um, and the encouragement that goes a long way from, from family and from my wife, of course. And, and then from there, it's building relationships, you know, and, and, you know, I think along the way, yeah, it keeps me grounded and true to who I am and what kind of music I want to make. You know, I've, I've been in a lot of different kind of bands. Like I said, I was in a in a country band that, with a record deal. We had two top 40 singles and that was with Damon Johnson from who now plays with, you know, Leonard Skinner and was in Brother Kane and played with Alice Cooper. And and uh, and it, I was said, you look, you know, I, that band was Sweet Home Alabama meets Hotel California. If we came out in the 70s, we'd been a rock band. But uh, it was just where we in 2007 and 2008, that's where we could get on the radio and um but anyway you know i i like it all you know and it's it's um you know matthew sweet was an indie rocker you know and that was fun to do and tal bachman was you know kind of a pop rock thing and i don't know i hate to put it in those small terms but uh because it's a bit different it's it's we all put things in boxes but uh, right. to me it's, you'll notice i didn't ask you about genres at all tonight no, i noticed that thank you <laughs> Um, I do want to take another quick break and then I have maybe two more questions for you. If that's cool. That's cool, man. I'm here. Okay. So we're going to listen to Medusa's disco blood and honey, and we will be right back. For whatever reason, my videos don't want to play tonight. So okay. we're just going to scrap <laughs> that. Um, if you're inter interested in attempting to win some tickets from Dus Dresky Entertainment and Music from the 412, it's musicfrom412.com slash contests. Um, we do have some tickets for Amy Grant coming up. Um, that one's off the top of my head. Um, the Borstal Boys, whose shirt I'm wearing. Um, we have tickets to them as well. Um, but go check it out, musicfrom412.com. You can uh, watch our 24-7 music videos from the Pittsburgh area or tune into our radio station where we play about two-thirds unsigned music and then about a third of uh, signed major bands, but not really the songs you're used to hearing from them. <laughs> um, okay, Buck. So I hear all the time from local musicians that they don't care if they're playing to two people or 200 people. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that you've played to way more than 200 people. Um, well, it's, what's, way what's more take fun. it's way more fun to play in front of 200 people than two people. I <laughs> to, and let's be real. Let's be honest. Um, I've played my fair share of clubs back in the day with my own music or other bands where it was empty. That's no fun. That's that's just that's being real, man. That's no fun. Yeah, I mean, we all want to get a chance to play. Now, I would say when I've played like the Bluebird Cafe in Nashville, Tennessee, now it's a room of about a hundred people, but they're all sitting down with food and cocktails, and they're right here. They're sitting like as close as this keyboard is to me, you know? And and it's just me and acoustic guitar, and I'm playing songs that I've written. And it's three other writers. And by the way, 
probably two of those writers have written major hit songs that everybody knows. Um, and anyway, it, that's intimidating. And that's like, it's a different thing because no one's talking. They're listening. You know, that's the thing about Nashville. They really listen for the song to every lyric. They're hanging on every word. That's tough, man. But it's also very rewarding. So it's different. But yeah, look, the rush you get when you walk on stage and it's I'm with Aerosmith or the Vampires and it's 100,000 people at this huge rock festival in Europe or in South America and they're screaming at the top of their head. That's like a roar you can't, I can't imagine. You know, that's that, that you can't imagine that I've been experienced fortunate enough to experience a few times. I don't know. I, I tried to, over the last summer, I had these uh, sunglasses that would record video and audio and I would walk on stage at these festivals just to give my fans on Instagram um, and friends a chance to see, this is what it feels like. You know, I'm off stage, there's Johnny and we're about to walk on stage and I'm going up to my riser to the keyboards and, and look at that. You know, how cool is that? You know, I mean, that's fun, but I mean, honestly, yes, if I'm playing in a club and it's a couple hundred people instead of a hundred thousand and they're into it, man, that's that's killer too. That's fun. You know, it's um um I think anytime you're around people and they're they're really into you and listening, not so much about me, but the music, you know, they're there for the same reason you are there to play it, you know. We're all there to enjoy it. And um, and if they they're feeling it, man. If it's, I guess, if you're in a room and it's me and you and one other person and you guys are enjoying it, I'm enjoying it too, you know? And if it's 200,000 or whatever, but they're a football field away, I'm enjoying it. It's just a different type of thing. So right. I don't know if that answers so, your question. <laughs> it, it does. And I had a thought when you were talking about doing the singer-songwriter shows in Nashville. Yeah. I have a friend who was a guitar player in one of the first bands I ever designed a website for who now lives in Nashville mm -hmm. and is a singer songwriter. Yeah. And um, he is also a um, elementary school teacher teaching music in Nashville. Yeah. And now I have to wonder if you guys have ever been at the same place at the same time. And I'm sure you would have no idea. So I'm not even, a, well, I'll throw his name out just so he can say, I yep. was talked about his name is Jared Grease. Jared Grease. Yeah. Um, um, don't think I've had the pleasure. Yeah, I, yeah, I, that's that's like asking someone, hey, did you graduate with so and so? But well, hey, listen, but now you can say that he was talked about while you were on the I, air. <laughs> I can I can in my neighborhood, I can throw a rock in any direction and hit a great musician in this town. There's a lot. There's a lot of great talent here. And, uh, you know, and that's great that he's doing that. He, that he's writing songs, but also teaching kids. And um, that's a beautiful thing. I love that. I, so here's the last question I have for you. And All of right. It's going to be one of mine, not a normal radio type one. All right. So you're standing at the crossroads that Robert Johnson once stood at mm -hmm. and sold his soul to the devil to become a great guitar player. Um, why are you standing at those crossroads? And if uh, you don't like the way it's worded, what's something that you haven't gotten to do that you would like to do? Well, I would say the reason I'm probably standing there because I have a terrible sense of direction. <laughs> <laughs> and um you know i'm like well, who do i ask for directions i'm afraid no, i can figure this out you know <laughs> um i don't know man i i i feel like i've been pretty lucky i'm you know i hit the jackpot that i get to i got to choose what i love to do and make a living at it most people on this planet don't and uh so that's success now it doesn't mean it was easy it still isn't easy you know, um, it's a struggle, you know, and I'm not, not to be not to sound all, you know, it's tough. Uh, but getting here, you know, for many years, you know, it was a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and ramen noodles for many years. And, you know, but we stuck to it and perseverance is a big part of that. And so if I <clears throat> if I had to ask the devil, make a deal with the devil, I would say, um, I don't know, man, I think I'm good. You know, <laughs> I'm uh, I don't I don't need you. Need you. I'll find my own way. Nice. I, I like the. I, I think I might be lost. Part. Was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, uh, I'll get lost in a mall. I'm like, okay, I was just here. Now, how do I get? No. All right. So I lied. I'm going to ask you one more question. No, you're good, you man. Go. 
Uh, over the years, and this one could possibly get you in trouble, um, who would you say has been your biggest supporter as a musician? As far as somebody I worked with? Um, anybody. anybody. Well, I guess, I guess it has to go back to my wife and my family. I mean, I know that's kind of a dull answer, but it's the truth, you know. Um, like, I wouldn't be here where I am without them, you know. And the like, again, the encouragement, you know. I mean, I know a lot of people that never got out the front door because they were never encouraged. And that took a lot of strength for those who didn't get that to, to break through that and say, no, I can do this. So I was lucky I had that. And I had a wife that um, believed in me and knew I could do this. Um, you know, maybe it was a, be both of us being a little naive in the early days, but I think you got to have that, you know, that sense of uh, we're in Los Angeles, we're doing it, you know, we're going to make it, you know, and uh, it took way longer than you even could possibly imagine. But, um, but that's OK. You know, it's part of the you got to enjoy their journey. In getting there, you know, that's part of it, enjoying the ride. So, um, I, yeah, I think I think my parents and my wife, and uh, as far as any collaborators, I had one guy I should mention, Charlie Midnight, who's been my longtime um, songwriting collaborator uh, for over 20 years. We've written, I don't know, two or 300 songs together. I lost count. And Charlie's, he's one of the great songs, songwriting I don't know, wordsmith in the in the world. He wrote Living in America for James Brown. He wrote a song that Joni Mitchell recorded uh, because she liked his lyric. And he wrote uh, he wrote and produced Joe Cocker and the Doobie Brothers and 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 uh, Hillary Duff. <laughs> That's pretty diverse, you know, yes. <laughs> um, but he's a genius. And so he's always been an advocate of mine and, and a supporter and, and a believer. And uh and all the people he works with, you know, um, and he knows, I mean, that, that meant a lot to me. It's like, Oh yeah. Okay. I'm in good company here. And this, this guy really wants to continue to work with me. So, and uh, you know, we've still right to this day. Very cool. Hey, I, I want to thank you for hanging out with me for the last about half hour or so. Yeah, Bill, I loved it, man. This is awesome. Thank you. Um, for those of you that are watching or listening, um, you want to go to buckjohnson.com. Um, check out that single, um, Just Feel Better, and um, read the bio, look at all the credentials, and try not to fangirl like I was before I came on earlier. Stop it. <laughs> hey, just, you know, got some good merch there, and but, uh, you know, find me on Instagram, too, Buck Johnson Official. I love to, um, if that's okay to mention, I, I like to, yeah, uh, you know, meet fans and, and correspond there. I put a lot of my new stuff there, any kind of... Uh, you know, the content that's coming out. I got another single coming out uh, April 5th and, um, and it's, it's more of a rocker. So uh, I think it's more of an up-tempo rocker that people will be, you know, I think will enjoy, but there's be, there's going to be more singles coming throughout the year. The album will drop in uh, September 13th. So uh, we're going to keep the singles coming and then the record in September. Um. So I need to keep on Danielle and tell her to keep me yeah. surprised on what's going on. Absolutely. Um, I, so um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and let Buck go off into the evening. And for those of you that are watching for the first time, possibly in about 20 minutes, if you go to music from 412.com slash radio or build slash radio or if you want to listen through Scotland, you can go to xrpradio.co.uk. Any of those three radio stations will be replaying this with the music playing. And uh, I do have two more tracks to play in this episode. They are Dream the Heavy, There You Go, and Travolta, Brother. And this has been episode number 715 of the Pennsylvania Rock Show. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight.